Hmm, get a tragic here, and this is something a little bit new. Basically, as some of you may know, if you've been following my blog the, on Board Game Geek, links in the description, I've been designing a new Mage Knight. Uh, I want to get back into board game design, so I thought that as a little sort of get the juices flowing, I'm going to design a mini expansion for Mage Knight. I'm going to make two mages. Uh, I haven't decided the name of the, the expansion, but it's basically going to be Life and Death, something like that. So the first Mage Knight's going to be a Necromancer, and the other Mage Knight's going to be a, a Dryad or an Ent or something, so it's going to be Death Magic and Life Magic. I've uh, set up some things so other people can play test the knight and uh, give me some feedback if they wish. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a solo game with a dummy player so it's quicker and just demonstrate how to use the knight that I've uploaded to the work workshop and just give you an idea of kind of the things I'm thinking of as I play this, uh, you know, design ideas as I play this. And I'm open to any suggestions that you put into the description, uh, into the comments. Okay, so basically what you want to do, you want to go create a single player and you want to go to the workshop and you need to look for, just type in tragic and that sort of filters all my mods on the workshop that you might have downloaded. And there's one for Mage Knight, it's called Tragic Edition version two. And the mod, the it works with this one. Now this one isn't as scripted as Tufts, this is my own version. So there's that issue as well. So just load it up and it will load up the mod. Then just go to the Necromancer I, actually, I should name that tragic as well. I don't know why I haven't done that. I will change that. But then you find the Necromancer mod, right? So you could just type Necro. Click on the little buttons here and you go search and that opens up the mod and you need the bag called Necro Temp. Just drag that out. And then you can drag out, this is a little PDF that has the description of all the skills for you. And then you drag out this little bag and then you drag out another one of these sort of tokens. Now this token, this is only designed at the moment to work on the player two position. That's this one here. So just pick it up and just drop it on the, you know, the thing as you go. There you go. And then bring out the dummy player that's here. And that's about it. Now I like playing with the Tesla monsters, so I'm going to turn them on. I'm just going to leave everything off like this. And then I'll just do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to chuck the co-op thing in there. And I'll just chuck out the competitive skill. I'm not going to use it. And then I'm just going to do clean up and start game. And that's just going to set up the board. Like so. Then I'm going to go random mage knight and just choose the dummy. And now you're ready to go. So this is the knight. Now his skills, if you pull them out, they've just got numbers because I don't want to have to, des you know, as I'm changing them, I don't want to redesign them. So all you need to do is put this sort of next to you somewhere and, uh, you know, then you can just read it. So if you, you pull out skill three, you just come down, skill three. Add one black mana token for each black mana and black mana token currently in the Mage Knights play area to a maximum of three. Now these aren't proofread and, you know, like I said, it's just the initial design at the moment. So there's two pages. Okay, so that's basically how it works. So I'm gonna do a core. I'll just do a solo conquest. It's the most common thing that people play. So I need seven country tiles, I need two core city tiles, and I need two non-city tiles. Okay, build map pool, boom. And it is three days, three nights. So I just set that to three, it's already set to three. That's just a little timer so I know what's going on. And we're basically ready to play. I'm just gonna grab all these things and give them a shuffle, and then lock them, and then just drag out the tokens we need. Ooh. Token. Okay, and that is it. We are ready to start playing. Oh, I just got to roll the die. So in my mod, you roll the die, I just sort of chucking him into the corner of the 
player mat like that. And we are ready to go. So right click to reshuffle the cards. And we'll draw a five. Put this back in here. And shuffle this. Okay, so we're ready to play. Ah, so we've actually drawn one of my new cards. This is the Undead Horde card, and it's replacing the Rage card. And I'll basically what this does is allows you to place undead units that you've killed into your unit slot, but they go on top of existing units. So the unit doesn't need to be activated. I mean, it could be already activated and you can still do it, but the activation token doesn't change. And basically, if it's a level two, you can hold two undead units in the horde. If it's a level four, you can hold four undead units in the horde. And uh, basically, the second power allows you to actually use the units. And I'll try and obviously trigger this and show you how it works at the time. Okay, so I'm just gonna have a little interlude here and just talk about some of my design philosophies for making print and play content, as well as talk about the Necromancer a little bit. Now at the end of the video, I'm gonna talk about specifics of how the cards work and how the skills work, but I just wanna get this out there so you get a kind of general idea of how I work making PNP content. For starters, I want this guy to be themed around death magic, right? And that means I want him to be themed around the black die. Now, a lot of his skills and spells and stuff require black mana because, you know, the evil mana, so to speak. You might say, well, that means he can't do anything during the day. That's not exactly true. There's basically just no reason to use black mana during the day. There's actually quite a lot of things in Mage Knight where you can use black mana during the day. For example... Uh, the Red Witcher has a skill called polymorphism or something where you can sort of use a use a die for its opposite color and you can use a black die as a gold die or a gold die as a black die. And that means you can take them in the opposite day. So there's, there's no rule saying you can't use it, use a black die during the day. There's just no reason to, but there will be with this guy. Oh, pretty much all his abilities are enhanced by black mana to sort of go into that evil black forbidden magic scene, right? Obviously he's a necromancer, so he's all about raising the dead. And I'm gonna be using Krang's puppet master skill as a sort of base idea. So the puppet master skill says, either keep one enemy token you defeated this turn or discard one previously kept enemy token. If you discard one, then get attack at half its strength of its attack value or block at half its armor value or round it up. If a token has cold fire, it's got cold fire, whatever. The point is, Puppet Master is basically the same idea. You take control of a unit, and then you can use it either as attack or block. Remember, not as armor, so you can't absorb wounds, it's attack or block. The undead's gonna be using this skill as a kind of guide on how to do it. So all the undead skills are all halved, are all half values and stuff like that. So it's sort of based on Puppet Master. The other thing I want is I want this guy to be evil. Like raising the dead is a minus three reputation hit. And basically using the undead gives you reputation hits. So by the end of the game, you're going to be down here at the X value. Reputation doesn't actually affect your final score, but it does affect your ability to buy units and buy spells, which is incredibly important in this game. So there are skills and cards that I'll talk about at the end of the, the video, which sort of mitigate the problem with being on the wrong end of the reputation track. So that's basically the ideas. So that's basically the main ideas of what I want the Necromancer to play like. In addition, I have some general rules for making PNP content, which I'm following as well. The first rule is quite simple. No new rules. Don't add, I'm not going to be adding any kind of rules outside the card text or the skill text on the actual components. 
So there's no new rules because I want this game to be, I want these guys to be compatible with the existing game and the other knights. Because remember, for me anyway, and a lot of people, this is a competitive game. If you don't want them too powerful and you don't want any kind of weird rules interfering with how the rest of the game already functions, because it's a pretty dense game already. So no new rules, except what's on the card text or the skill text. The other is a personal rule I have, which is just make everything weak. Like it is so easy as a gamer to design a cool effect and go, oh, this effect's so cool. And then you play test it and the effect is cool. So you have a lot of fun playing it. But is it balanced? Is it overpowered? And usually the answer is yes. Like if you look at the PNP community, most of the stuff people create and I, I do actually mean that. I mean, I don't want to sound too rude about it, but a lot of content that people create for games are ridiculously overpowered. I mean, they are so strong, some of the effects that people add. So my philosophy in making PNP content is make everything expensive and make everything weak. And then you can increase it up. And the reason for that is it's a lot easier to make adjustments making things more powerful than it is to make adjustments to make things weaker. And that is because if you're play testing and you come to a particular game state and then you play a card or play an effect or whatever, and you then get past that game state, the game flow of playing the game just doesn't break. It's a continual stream. You might think, oh, that was a bit easy, but especially when the balance is close, you just go straight ahead. You just keep going on to the next game state. But if the effect is too weak or too expensive, the game literally stops. You basically go, I can't do what I want to do. And that makes you think, is it too weak? And that allows you to adjust, slowly adjust it up until you get to the point where you reach the game state, but it takes decision making to actually get past it. And that's where you want to be. You want to make the cards useful so you can get past game states but you don't want to just blow past game states game states <laughs> how many times can i say game states the point is it's a lot easier to design weak and build up than bring down and you can see that in many games like there's a common game design problem called power creep especially in a card games that have been around forever like magic the gathering or whatever and that is often caused by the fact that you go I need to make a card. I need a cool effect that's fun to play. What's fun to play? You know what's fun to play? Powerful effects. So gradually everything gets more and more powerful. And the only real way I know how to design things is to try and do it the opposite way. Try and make everything weak or really expensive. So that's what's going to be happening at this stage of the play testing for this guy. Hopefully everything's going to be too hard to use if I've done my job right. <laughs> Uh, and then I can adjust it up. So that's just something to keep in mind. Anyway, I'm going to be talking about the specifics of the cards and the skills at the end of the video, or maybe in a second video. Okay, that's that. And I'll see you guys next time. Oh, wait, it's not the end of the video. There's a whole other thing. Let's get back to the turn. Now, does uh, solo mode, uh, so, so long as I've played solo mode, do you actually have to discard tactics? Yeah, at the end of the day, remove both tactic cards from the game. Yeah, so you only get to use the tactics once. God, it's been so long since I've played solo. Shuffle that. Now, it's hard choosing these tactics. Like, you want to, you don't want to choose the best tactics. Like, it would be, you want to keep planning. But at the same time, if he takes planning, you'll be very upset. So maybe it's best to take the best cards first. So that's what I think I'm going to do. I think I'm going to just ta start with taking great start and hope for the best. Shuffle. Beautiful. Okay, so we go first. Let's draw two cards. Okay. What have we got here? Well, blue crystal. So the Necromancer uses a lot of magical power. So his goal is to build his horde. Now the horde is quite powerful, but it requires a lot of magic. So he's trying to find crystals. He's trying to generate as many crystals as possible. That's his goal. Let's uh, grab this one here. So we need five movement. 
So I'll just go four, five. I'm actually going to use this card. This is one of our new fancy cards. Is that the problem is like because because the horde is so powerful. I've tried to make the requirements to build the horde, and also to, there's a, there's a couple of skills that allow you to raise single undead. I don't want them to really be done in the early turns. So you have to wait till you have a unit, and then you have to actually have spare mana to do it. So it's basically a dead card at the beginning. It is replacing rage, so you can use it for four, a basic four attack as well. So it actually will kill this guy, so I actually will keep it. And I will discard this one. That's a new addition. Because I found out that this was card was often dead. So I given it, so I switched it from it used to replace threaten. But I actually found that this uh card was often a dead card, so I, I wanted to keep the attack four on it and replace rage. Anyway, so we've moved five. One, two, three, four, five, and we gain a blue crystal. And then he draws three, white, one, two. And draw back up to five. We've always still got five in our hand. This guy, if we're going to attack him, we need to block for four and attack for four. Now, the problem is he has vampiric, which means that he's going to give us, if we take two wounds, we're going to actually have to fight him for six. So I'm going to go crystallize. Pay with a blue mana. That gives me a red crystal, which I'm going to go four, five, six. And then we take two wounds. That's four attack, five, six. And we kill this guy for six. Okay, that's all done. It's two, one, two. And one up. Okay. At the end of that turn, draw three. Another white. One, two. Gee, it's going quickly. Draw up to five. We have a green mana crystal. Thank you. So we're going to delete these two. Oh, and... We're sitting, we sat on the crystals, so we actually get a crystal for last turn and a crystal for this turn. And those crystals are really important to how this guy functions. So that was a very good start for him. Okay. Right. So we're going to go, well, I forgot to bring out, let's bring out the monastery. What have we got here? Okay, so this is a good card for us. It gives us a crystal and it's got siege attack three. And this is a great uh, power crystal we want as well. So there's very good cards out for us. So we're going to go for Bam. There's one, two, three, four. So three. Okay. We've only got two more turns left. Okay, so we're going to go five, six. So that is five influence plus one is six. That is what it takes to buy a action card from the monastery. And we're going to take the sucker. And then this one is going to declare end of round. And we're going to draw to five. And here is the other one. This is the influence one. I'll get to that when we get around to using it. Firstly, click this, go to green crystal. And we're going to go one, two. Hmm. One, two, let's just do one, two, three. We'll just keep the rage and the concentration just in case a monster's right next to us. And we will explore. 
Okay, so I really should have done the two. Oh well, I'm gonna do two anyway. It doesn't really make a difference actually. And that is the end of round one. Very simple. Okay, so let's just reset that deck. This guy gets added to the dummy and it's a white crystal getting added. Okay, let's re-roll these suckers. And flick it over to Knight. Search. We're going to take Minus Search. And he's going to take. Oh, perfect. Oh, my, my cat's meowing. What do you want, puss? Oh, draw up to five. Okay, so we don't have any monastery cards. Do we have any monastery units? Because it's very important to get a unit. So we can buy this one at the monastery. So we're going to do that. That costs four. Our reputation is zero. So we're just going to go bam. Boom. And it says, gain four influence. If you pay a black mana token during an interaction that does not involve buying a unit, ignore the effect of the X space on the reputation track. So the idea of this guy is that he's evil. So if you play it in a way that I envision it through the design, it should you should end up on the X space all the time. Because every time you raise the dead, it's like a minus three penalty to reputation. And you can see the, the top influence here allows you to basically coerce and corrupt people. I'm going to re reword this to add the idea of corruption. So you can corrupt other units and then they become, they get the thug symbol. So you get the reverse recruitment. Anyway, whatever. The point is, this is gain for influence and this guy costs for influence. So that is the end of that. Okay, draw three cards. Oh, another white. One, two, three. Ugh. Okay, let's draw it back up to five. So it's three to get in here. I didn't bring out this guy. Now the question is, what I might do is I'll go four, five, six. So it's one, two, three. Four, five. Another orc. And there's another monastery. What have we got here? Ooh, blood ritual. Not a bad card for the necromancer. That is a very good one for him. And we are on a white and red, so we're going to take a white crystal. He's going to draw three. Back up to five. God, more move. So I'm going to go four. What have you got here? So it's three, four, five to get in there. We have no attack, so that's not good. So we're just going to go four. I want to save that green. Actually, we've got three green, three blue crystals, so I am going to take this green. I just want to keep my heal available. So that's four. So that is one, two, three. And let's get rid of that. Blue, draw one. Give us an attack. Oh, another move. That's unbelievable. Okay, it's night time, so we're going to use the reroll on this. Because we've got mana search. Now, I know I'm going very quick, but I'm trying to... <laughs> Test the cards rather than play the game. So four. 
this is sort of showing you more about how I play when I'm by myself. <laughs> okay, load. Green. Okay, two. Okay, I'm gonna have to discard cards if I don't get an attack card next round. Still no attack cards. This is unbelievable. Okay, I'm gonna pay for this. Oh, I'm gonna just re-roll both of these guys, try and get a green. This is a very bad turn for us. Ah, we got a green, that's good. Come on. Draw two cards, one, two. Okay, so we have an attack card now. So this is three block and three attack. One, two, three. I'll just keep that one. One, two, three block and three attack. Okay, that guy's dead. Plus one, and we finally, one, two, get a level up. Oh, and we also have a elementalist token. Okay, so we're definitely gonna take this crystal card. And let's have a look at our skills. Shuffle. So we get nine and three. So nine is plus two move at night, plus one move during the day. And the other one is three, which is add one black mana token for each black mana and black mana token currently in the Mage Knight's play area to a maximum of three. So another thing about this guy is that he's supposed to basically be all about the black mana, trying to make the black mana uh, a die that is used regularly. So a lot of his skills and abilities require black mana. So he has some black mana generation skills. So like his version of these gain of crystal stills is like gain a red crystal and a black mana token. Let's draw three cards. Oh, God, it's the end of the turn already. This is a terrible turn for us. Okay. Oh, we have the undead. And we've got six attack. We've got no move now. Two move to get in there. Let's uh, re-roll this one. Really badly need a move. Have we got any move? We had all our move at the beginning. We've got one, two, three, four. So we've had all our move, plus we've had our improvisation. So there is no more move in the deck. Okay, so this has actually got move on it, doesn't it? Move four. So we pay for that with a green. We do have a green. So that's move four. That gets us in here. There is no wall there, so it's only two to get in. Okay, so we're gonna take three damage. One, two, three. Now we just have to hit back for four. So we just do this. Blue or white or red, so that's red, four attack. So this guy is now dead, okay, but we also have the Undead Horde. So it says, directly after defeating an enemy, spend mana, enemy's fane divided by two rounded up with black mana counting twice. No gold payments allowed. So this guy's fame is five. That means we have to pay three mana to resurrect this undead. There's a black, so that's one, two. And bam, we'll just take a second die, which will take the red. 
and that is three mana being paid. So, enemy's fane divided by two, rounded up, black mana count twice, no gold. Place on an unwounded unit or existing horde, maintaining slot activation status. So, this can go onto this unit, but the activation token stays where it is. Units can hold undead up to their level, discard an extra card per undead already in horde. So this guy here is a level one, so he can only hold one unit. But if this was level two, and I wanted to add to that horde, I wouldn't be able to do it with this hand because I would need to discard a second card. And this should be flipped over. I've got to add that to the, to the rules. Okay. So I've got my undead horde there. And that is the end of that. Plus, I also killed this guy. So he gives us, what, four fame, wasn't it? Five fame? Five fame. So we go down one, and we get five fame. One, two, three, four, five. And that gives us a new slot. Okay, he declares end of round. And let's draw up to five. Ah, oh, we do have an influence. Is there uh, another guy here? Yeah, this guy's six and we're at zero. So let's just re-roll two of these dice. Give us a red. Ooh, beautiful. So we get a red. Five. Oh no, we can't do it. So this is a timing thing, right? So it's minus five, minus one reputation. So you actually get the minus reputation as soon as you cast the card. Oh wait, we don't get a negative, so that's fine. So we're still at zero, so that's five, six. This guy is hired. And remember, we're just using these guys to murderize them for their souls so we can raise the dead. And that is the end of round two. So we shuffle that, we shuffle that. Boom, gets added to deck and a red gets added to dude. And it is now day. So this these dice here just count the days and nights and this is showing us how many is the total. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop there, kind of see how this is working. So what I'm gonna do, I, you guys won't be able to do this. I might upload this to Google Docs but I have a uh, document. So if I just come down here and I just grab, oh, I completely forgot about the plus two move. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna put that in the description. So when I mouse over it, I can actually see what it is now. Yeah, so I had plus two move that whole time during the night. I'm an idiot. Whatevs, man. Okay, so remember if it's half rounded up or whatever, so it's gotta be over half, the, the source has to be a a non a non uh, other color die or whatever. So I'll just re-roll those two. Okay, and we're ready to go for the next turn. This guy is also in here. I'm just gonna drag him up. All right, and that is our position. Okay, so that is basically how to play test this guy if you wanna play test him. And uh, I'll finish this play test on the channel, but I probably won't do a lot of the others. I wanna go quickly and try and get this guy done and then I wanna work on the other one. I'll see you guys next time.